chapters. So I'm going to read you a little, you know, a little smorgasbord. I think I'll start with a, um, a heartbreaking love poem. It's called Love in Apple Seeds. I'm Eve, but this is not about me. <laughs> Adam and Eve are not the only thing in my mind. I'm still holding the letter you sent, reading the line, the more you see the world, the more you miss me. Even though we've been banished from our Eden, my scent was still upon you in good deep smell of earth and wine around your head and shoulders and thighs. I was your dark love, holy light, your one true wife, deep and on fire, a sweet angel of the dusk. You were born like a child to whimper, breathing my name hard and tall as you were God. I was yours. And you were a desperate and dire love of me, and you called me mother with a brow of smoke. And I could drink all my rivers, my Nile, my Amazon, my Mississippi. You could drown the brown, slow moving currents, flash white glance blue, sink without a struggle. You said my voice was smooth and low, molten by cellos, tickled the small hairs and thrills of your neck. My throaty laughter lingered in your ears and your mouth. You were most infected with the smolder, the parch of my forever, my fever. I was your desert lioness, and you wanted to know if I would be with you in the pride, forgive you all your sins. You were ready to lay down your white cross on my altar, my holy altar of flesh, unswerving hearts of blood. Pure as the semen of stars, my scent still on you. A sickness soft in your belly, my tears alive in your cheeks, maddening breath on your breast, tongue a cat's rasp in the back of your mouth. My lips in your eyes curved. You called it our flight from Egypt, but it was that time in paradise before the fall when you were the first man and I was the first woman, and it was worth the price of too much ecstasy, knowing too much joy when we were told it was a sin, and eventually we'd be split in half like an apple, our seeds in the wind roads and worlds apart, less traveled, not together, but forever in a simple poem. Um, I'm gonna read you something from a, a collection that I've been putting together called Celebrity Sightings. These are fictional and sometimes for real. Here is um, John or Paul or George or Ringo. Every girl has her beetle. It's a way of letting people know who you are. I have a public favorite and a private one. <laughs> the one I'm known for is George. This really wasn't a choice, but a consolation. <laughs> Shelly, the most aggressive girl in our crowd, announced hers was John. Barbara, who was manicured nail, who has manicured nails, took Paul, and Carol, Shelley's little sister, insisted on Ringo. It was my turn to choose. I said, John. The girls glared at me. <laughs> Didn't I know John was taken? <laughs> yes, but I love John. Too late, he's taken, Shelley snapped. I, I knew Shelley didn't choose John because she identified with him. She chose him because she believed John was the Beatles' leader and she was our leader. But, but I, I, don't, I don't identify with George. He's too quiet and I have a hat just like John's. And I also have a notebook with new doodles and one-liners in John's best absurd surrealistic style. John and I are so alike, I'm political, rebellious sometimes rude, and I have tried drugs. The argument did not sway my friends, not at all. Shelley had spoken for John first. With girls, this is how it is. When you stake a claim on a boy, <laughs> girls are very territorial about this. Whoever speaks up first gets possession of the possibility. This is more than a rule, it's a tradition. And if you go against a tradition, you may end up 
without girlfriends. And since girlfriends are known to have greater relationship endurance than boyfriends, I complied. I said, okay, I choose George. My friends seem genuinely pleased for me. So if I were lucky, unfortunately, I didn't bond with George and never did, but I act as if I have, all the time aching for John. As for my girlfriends, they seem to be very fond of their Beatles, so I pretend to be deeply interested and devoted to George, hoping the friendships with my girlfriends are worth the price of this sacrifice, <laughs> not being known for who I really am. <laughs> Montgomery Cliff's last scene. Even though Montgomery Cliff told me he loved men, it didn't stop me from wanting him. He was gentle, soulful, and dangerous. That was totally sexy to me. He knew I was crazy about him, so one day he let me mount him. When I entered his den, he was reading a script that he was considering for his next project. He rolled over on his stomach and asked me to rub his back. I lay down on top of him and started to massage his shoulders. I asked him about the script. It was by Arthur Miller. He suggested we remove our clothes. I suggested he turn, o turn the lights off. We resumed our positions. I remained on top, pressing against the length of his body. He told me Marilyn Monroe had agreed to do the picture, even though she and Arthur had already divorced. Soon I was breathing harder and harder and harder. As he was moving gently under me, I pushed against him, fucking him slowly. He told me Clark Gable was going to do the movie too. Our bodies were melting with sweet sweat and rhythm. Monty started to groan. I held on to him and sucked at his shoulder, his neck, until my face was buried in his hair. My breath was short and hot. As Monty came, he shouted out the name of the film, The Misfits, and I shouted back, Do it! <laughs> Got um, six minutes. Okay, I'm I'm gonna just go right to something I think is important to me tonight, and then that will be it for me. But thank you, oh, thank you, Philip, and thank you all. You're all such such great writers and great audience, and that's it. Let me, let me finish up with something. This is sexy and political. <laughs> it's called Just Cause. <laughs> <laughs> Just cause, I could write about international cataclysm, Iraq, Palestine, Pakistan, Kashmir, India, Afghanistan, Jerusalem, Gaza, Sudan, Al-Qaeda, Korea, Iran. Nuclear threat threats, suicide bombers decapitating a man. Just cause. The objective to remove demon logic from cataract view, obliterated essential evil, reflected in camouflage eyes, early morning Twitter surprise, beneath burqa, kafia, long red tie, crusade of lasers, missiles, patriots, tanks roll by, from the front line, 24 hours live. I could write about another distant or urban war. I could write about the memory of the last century, not yet two decades old. I could write about the possibility of a total just cause. But I choose to write about sex and cigarettes, football and chicken, a man and a woman, just cause there is real mystery in the way we eat, the way we listen to beauty, the way we take things into our bodies, the way we exhale the pleasure into someone's mouth, round and wet and open. There's little mystery to me in how we kill each other, lose our minds, kill time, Listen to an adagio, stroke each stroke slow, relax and feel each finger stroke each note. While fire burns, ice melts into storms, heads decapitated, sets on sticks held high, beaten, marginalized, tortured, defiled, stations local to national report of international rape, oil spill, poison smoke, the drive-by battlefield next door, racial injustice, and those who think it's a joke, 
na neo-nationalist, white supremacist, torch-marching folks. I could write so many more. There's always another just cause that challenges our humanity. Just cause saying, staying, staying sane is amazing in an insane society, which is what Eric Fromm said, sort of about the choice we all have to make on how we're going to live. But for tonight, tonight before I return to my post resisting the dark and weary occurrences, as men link arms and take knees, I choose to write about sex and cigarettes, football and chicken, a man and a woman just cause. In all ways, everything I know is in the mystery of these exchanges. The ball is high. Outside there is a warm breeze and the boats hardly shift while I drift between the smooth water and the kitchen. Wanna eat chicken, go fishing, Touch down and sleep between your tongue, your warm breeze, like the smell of home cooking. And there's the call, and one pass is complete, watching the smooth water while smoke curls from your black tobacco, textures the edge of your fingertips, touching lip to lip. As the sun slips into the final games of the final minutes of the game, rocking to your breath, hot and heavy, caress as you groan, just cause, just cause, just cause. It is so easy to, just cause. <laughs>